It's with very great pleasure that I'm introducing Simon Peyton Jones to give us his perspective on the coming together of mathematics and computer science in education. Simon has made major contributions to the application of mathematical theory to practical, to practical computer language design. Simon has been a very good friend to those of us engaged in classroom research in Gitenya mathematics and functional programming. Over the years, ATM members have contributed extensively to computer supported mathematical education. Accordingly, we look forward to a stimulating talk and discussion. Simon. Great, thank you, Ian. Um, uh, let me share a screen here um, and still be able to see chat. Yes, good. Um, well, it's a great pleasure and privilege to to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's um, um, to be uh, invited to address a um, bunch of uh, teachers of mathematics is quite a privilege uh, for computer scientists. So I'm not a teacher and I'm not a mathematician, though I did two years worth of a math degree at Cambridge. Um, but nowadays, uh, all research computer scientists are basically mathematicians in disguise anyway. Um, now, uh, Ian tells me that you're a, a um, uh, I, I should not worry too much that, uh, that you'll be sort of sit there like um, a uh, quiet, uh, polite audience, that you're feisty, even argumentative. So please um, make comments or uh, write questions in the chat, which I'll monitor and Ian will monitor as well and maybe interrupt me. It would be more fun for me if this turned into some kind of conversation rather than just a monologue. I have plenty to say, but um, uh, but it, I, I, we will just cut and make sure that we get to the end. And then then we're going to divide into breakout, breakout groups at the end. Um, OK. so. Um, Here's our um, starting point then. Um, computing is now, um, uh, has now become established as a foundational subject alongside um, maths and natural science that every child learns from primary school onwards. This is what the national curriculum says in so many words. It says that all children from primary school should understand and apply the fundamental principles of computer science and should be able to analyze program problems in computational terms and have repeated practical experience of writing programs to solve such problems. So that's pretty direct, pretty black and white. It's moved computing from a, um, a kind of instrumental or perhaps even vocational subject that you might study um, somewhat, um, you might study for the, for, for the purposes of being able to operate a computer well, right, to a foundational subject that you might study for, um, so that you can understand the world that surrounds you. So, um, and, and the reasons are exactly the same that we want to uh, study maths and natural science for every child from primary school onwards, namely so that it equips children to have, um, to understand and have agency in and be able to make informed choices about the natural, and the digital world that surrounds them. That's why we teach children um, physics. It's not because they're all going to become physicists. It's because if you know nothing about physics, you are disempowered and un unable to make informed choices about the world that surrounds you. And it's just the same with computing. So that's a pretty big shift of perspective. Um, and the question that we want to talk about today is how might that shift of perspective affect the relationship between computing and mathematics? Um, and the, the suggestion I want to put you before you, which was exemplified beautifully by George's talk earlier today, um, was maybe we could uh, think of it in, in a symbiotic way. So symbiosis means when two here um, uh, biological organisms have a somewhat close, intimate and long term interaction that enriches them both. That's what I'm after here. So um, here's a little uh, vignette um, that features Miles, who is uh, indeed here in this conversation, in, in, um, in the audience here today. Um, he was teaching a, a workshop using Scratch at a, um, in London several years ago. Um, and a teacher wrote to him subsequently and said this. He said, this, this um, uh, girl M realized that she could replace the repeated steps of a loop which was moving a turtle around and drawing a square. Instead of writing eight commands, she could write two commands wrapped in a, a for loop that just did those, those two commands four times. And she explained this to her colleagues in the class and she, was, she had the confidence to do that. And nobody really told her how to do this. She hadn't, hadn't had iteration explained to her. She just tried it out and it worked. Um, but what I really like is what this teacher wrote about her subsequent experience. She says, I have M self-esteem going through the roof and she has associated her computing success with mathematics. Over the last couple of weeks she's solved math problem after problem, she's met target after target, she's truly flying. 
and she's doing this because she's had a positive experience of computing. Now, for me, this I find this quite touching. It makes my, my, my sort of heart feels good. It's that sense of agency and empowerment that I think that we seek both as mathematicians and as computer scientists, and perhaps we're going to get even more by talking to each other. Before going there, though, I just want to highlight two um, related dangers. One is that we treat maths and computing as being in competition for limited timetable slots, right? That is, we conceive of ourselves as kind of um, competitors in the challenge of trying to get mind share of children or teachers um, fighting each other. This is not good, right? Because it's a zero sum game. Um, and actually, I think we can do uh, we can do better than that. We can, that's hence the title of this talk, maybe we can, by working together, we can, and in, enrich both of our subjects to, to you know, to, to, to the benefit of both. Um, the other danger is that computing is perceived as a kind of um, uh, useful, yes, um, perhaps even, you know, trendy at the, the, these days, um, decoration to the real subject, which is, of course, mathematics, right? So um, here is a symbiosis between the bird that picks the ticks out of the hide of the buffalo. Um, and that is a symbiosis, but it's slightly, slightly unequal partners here. I'd like to think of us as more, more equal partners in this game. And uh, another thing I picked up from George's talk earlier today was he's saying it's, it's, it's easy to sort of layer computing in to the curriculum and just say, well, look, um, you know, they're doing some programming and they're engaged. Look, it's exciting. But his question was, are they learning any mathematics? So rather than saying, we'll do one thing and then we'll spend a bit of time doing something else and look, it looks good and they're engaged. Let's try to make the most of this, um, this interaction. So what I would like to, um, the slogan I would like to suggest is that it's not just a way to do maths better, but we might even think of it as a way to do better maths and perhaps to do better computing too. Um, but this is the ATM conference, so let's concentrate on maths. So far, so good. Um, uh, let's just be, say a couple of things that I'm not talking about. So one is, um, of course, there's a lot about how to use um, information and communication technologies of various sorts to teach all subjects better right, uh, to use distance learning and flip learning and use the internet in a creative way. That's all very good, right? It's all very, it's, and it is important. It's just not what I'm talking about. Much closer to what I'm talking about was Alex's talk earlier today about how to change mathematics teaching because of the availability of computers as a tool. Um, but here was, his emphasis was very much on, um, you know, we're teaching maths and we're going to change the way we teach maths because of computers. And mine is a little bit more even handy. So these are, they're much closer, um, but they're not, not, not my primary focus. Okay. So first we have to say a little bit about more, a little bit about what we might mean by computing as a school subject. Remember in that words of that national curriculum, it said computer science. Now, when I was at university, um, not so long ago, no, only, only 40 years ago, <laughs> Uh, computing wasn't even a bona fide university subject, at least at the University of Cambridge. Um, it is now, um, and uh, but it, it's it's been quite a big step to think of it as a school subject rather than as a university specialism. I think of computing as the the study of information, computation, and communication, not notice data, algorithms, and networks. Right. So these are I'm trying to stress the discipline aspect of the subject here. And I put in sort of smaller writing some of the pieces of the that you might think of under these various headings. Um, and I put a box around them all to suggest that programming um, is a sort of cross cutting concern. It infuses and is you know everything is shot through with programming. Computing without programming would be like natural science without lab work. It would just be hopeless, but it's not the whole thing. So it isn't just about why we should teach our kids to code. It's about um, the underlying subject discipline. And there are lots of common themes between the study of computer science um, as a, a foundational discipline and the study of mathematics. So abstraction is a very obvious one, right? In Alex's talk, he was talking about abstracting from the real world to some kind of model of the real world um, and then doing some computation or some reasoning or some, um, uh, some calculation about it. Calculation was the word he used. And then finally, interpreting that back into the real world. And of course, that's what we do when we write programs. All the time, we are abstracting pieces from the real world into our programs. Programs deal in abstractions. Um, another very common theme is the idea of doing something once, right? With algebra, instead of doing something many times, we write some algebraic equations and we solve, you know, a million specific cases all in a single blow. Um, and 
if you write a function definition in Scratch or in Python, you are uh, parameterizing over the input parameters. You're doing something once rather than many times. And the abstraction that is algebra is quite similar to the abstraction that is a function. Um, and you have variables that stand for values. Uh, both uh, disciplines encourage precision in thinking rather remorselessly, actually, and logic. Logic plays a very fundamental role in computer science, um, as it does, of course, in mathematics. So there's lots of commonality. Now, but, the, but the, the, the one that I'd like to stress most of all is that I think of computing as mathematics made incarnate. That is, mathematics takes flesh, it becomes tangible, it becomes concrete, it becomes executable, it becomes experimental and exploratory, as um, some of George's examples showed, and often it becomes motivated by some kind of context. I'll show you some examples of that later. Um, so here is a slightly, um, you know, perhaps this isn't a primary school example, but um, maybe a secondary school example of what I mean by maths made incarnate. If I write a for loop um, and I um, to add up the numbers between, uh, you know, from one to n, um, well, um, then I've got something that looks very like a base case when I initialize the variable. I've got something that very looks like an inductive step when I um, add i to it. And then, if in fact, if I'm going to reason about um, the you know, the total that this loop computes in any particular iteration, that is what, what, what computer scientists would call the loop invariant, all I'm doing is I'm doing a proof by induction. So I think of loops as induction made executable, if you like. So whereas the, the idea of a proof by induction is a somewhat abstract thing, somewhat sophisticated thing, and yet primary, primary school children are in effect doing not exactly proof by induction, but they're doing inductive reasoning and execution um, from a very early stage. Mm, nothing in the chat so far, very ominous. Um, of course, I'm not the only person to have thought these kind of thoughts, right? <laughs> Everybody is um, thinking about this. The question is just how do you turn this into reality? So let me just give a few pointers to some other people who've done some brilliant work in this area. Um, uh, one is Celia Hoyle and Richard Noss's work on scratch maths, which I think many of you will come across. The URL is here in the slides. Um, and um, I, I like this, the way that they put it. Can we find a different language, that is a language different to the language in which mathematics is usually expressed, a different language and a set of ideas and approaches that is somehow more open and more accessible and more learnable and that somehow brings mathematics to life without you know, downplaying the mathematics. The mathematics is, is still the goal, right? <laughs> but, um, but it's maybe just expressed in a different language and a different, uh, a different sort of way into that cognitive space. Here is um, a, uh, uh, they have a very nice video on the Scratch Maths homepage. And I love this quote for this um, young woman who's describing what she liked about uh, participating in the Scratch Math project. She said, when, what I really like about Scratch is when you press that start button and you see your script come into action, it's like magic in front of your eyes. And here, she didn't mean the sort of magic that uh, um, Arthur C. Clarke was thinking about when he said any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from, from manage, magic, which I take to be a bad thing, magic that is not under my control, you know, made by somebody else. Um, here, she meant it's sort of miraculous that something that I did and that I understand does something so wonderful as draw these patterns. It's sort of, I found it very inspiring, this little video, you should watch it. Um, so that's Scratch Maths, and Scratch Maths is back with a whole bunch of, uh, it's uh, a primary school kind of level, and there's a whole bunch of actual tangible materials that you can try out, and I hope that you, if you haven't come across it before, I hope that you will. Here's another, um, which is perhaps a little bit less well known in this country, which is the Bootstrap World Project, and it's um, it has uh, four major units on algebra, reactive programming, data science, and physics. And there they're using, each of these is a pretty substantial strand. Um, and they're explicitly targeting learning maths. They're not targeting learning computing. They learn a lot, learn a lot of computing on the way. Um, and here, uh, you know, they're explicitly exercising mathematical concepts like coordinate planes, ratio and proportional domain and range, function composition, that kind of thing. Okay, so they're, they're, they're very explicit about the connection with mathematics. Um, and it's been extensively trialed in schools. These are all project, these are not just academics, you know, um, polishing their fingernails. These are people who are working in schools. Um, Paul Curzon 
uh, I wonder whether you all know Paul Curzon. He's an amazing computer scientist, works at Queen Mary College in London, but does a lot of work with schools. Um, he has a wonderful magazine called Computer Science for Fun, CS for Fun. Um, it's a website and magazine. Um, and he has a whole page here, I give him the, the, the list above, but that um, the URL here that describes how um, computer science and math, maths, and in particular numeracy, has a lot of examples about numeracy, can interwork with each other. Um, and um, then from this very conference, George, um, George's talk this morning, I thought was a brilliant description about how if we think of computing and maths in symbiosis, it might change how we think about teaching mathematics. I picked this, this little piece from one of his slides um, that uh, you, the learning is kind of, it's, it's kind of exploratory. You, you write an executable program and you keep changing bits of it and you explore um, in ways that would be hard to do with a pencil and paper. Um, he, he described it as playful. Um, and also that there's a lot of incidental learning going on that rather than just, you know, teaching saying your learning objective is this, you're just learning by, by, by trying things out, not in the completely unconstrained way of, of ju just, you know, be in a big room full of bits of kit and, you know, have fun. Um, it's quite directed, but there's quite a lot of incidental learning going on. I just put in the, this thing about immediate feedback, because I think this is also pretty significant. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a teacher, so um, you're better judges than me, but um, uh, computers are very pitiless about pointing out your mistakes. They do not say, oh, I better put this tactfully that you have a right and a bug in your program. No, it just doesn't work. Um, but at the same time, it's private and it's non-judgmental, right? The computer doesn't say you're a stupid person, um, uh, and and it's not uh, it's not a public humiliation. So it's you get a very tight feedback loop, um, but in a very non-judgmental kind of way. Ooh. Uh, I'm not going to um, uh, respond to Ibika's question yet. We can maybe do that in the panel discussion. Do you agree that computation is limited by mathematical logic and therefore artificial intelligence is not possible? It's a very open-ended question. Thank you, but maybe later. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, and Pip, I do agree, Scratch is tremendously useful in secondary and beyond. We should not regard Scratch as being, oh, just for babies, just for primary school students. It totally, you know, if you, if you do it Scratch, you, should, you probably should do it in Scratch. It's so immediate. Um, now, um, I wanted to give, uh, to, to um, bring this down to earth a bit by, I was challenging myself really to come down from these airy aspirations to something more tangible. So here are three tangible examples, which I'll give in successive levels of detail, just to give you another idea of what I, from a computer science point of view, um, am thinking about. Um, and, uh, but with the caveat, of course, that in, unlike these other projects that I've described, I'm not a school teacher. I do not teach mathematics. I do not work in a school. And so you will just have to make of this what you will. However, this one comes from an interaction I had with my nine-year-old um, son, Kenzie and who was um, doing some scratch programming and he said I want dad I want to make the the rocket go towards the planet but as it gets closer I want it to slow down so this wasn't terribly hard we did it together here's a um, how you might do it you want to move the rocket successively there's the forever loop with a little gap in between that's the weight 0.2 seconds and we'd like to move it how many steps oh the number of steps we want to move is something to do with the distance between the planet and the rocket so we need to subtract the distance of the um of the planet the x position of the planet from the x position of the rocket and then maybe to to choose how many steps we go we then have to scale it by something like it here I divided by 10. Um, so of course, you know, this is kind of second nature to all of this, but when I started to think about it, I realized that already in talking to Kenzie, without having to, 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 to um, uh, you know, have learning objectives and things, we'd already discussed coordinate geometry. Um, this was just in one dimension, in fact. We'd already discussed sort of grouping, right, that the subtraction occurs before the division um, and scaling, but he had to have some notion of proportion to scale it down. Um, and also, if the rocket was on the other side of the planet, I think this came up in George's talk, then you'd have a negative difference. You'd have so you'd the, the, the numerator would become negative. And um, it it's comes up, it, it's almost as if the child begs you to allow negative numbers rather than us having to say negative numbers are the object what you're your learning objective for this lesson right i would like mathematics to be something that children are begging us to say you know of course we must be able to do this and you say sure and you can 
Um, here is one other piece that um, barely came up when I was talking to Kenzie, which is that when the rocket gets close, so that the the number of um, uh, the distance between the two becomes, you know, round about 10 or a bit more than 10 or a bit less than 10, then you have to start talking about, well, what is 9 over 10? How many steps is that? And can Scratch talk about 9 over 10? Or will it round down or up? And you get the, that you get the things which um, computer people think about a lot. Um, now, uh, let me just look at these. Um, uh, there's lots of commentary here. This is really good. Thank you very much. Um, okay, but I think I'll, I think I'll none, none of them look like formulated in the form of questions. So I think I'll carry on. Um, so uh, let's see. Then um, then we try to do this in two dimensions. And I realized again, I was, this was a learning journey for me, actually, that, oh, so now I've got to move on a diagonal way. Um, but of course, I know that I can just do the X and the Y separately, but it was a bit of a bit of a surprise to Kenzie. I don't know whether he really got it, but the idea that we can just think about the X displacement and the Y displacement sort of separately, and they'll add up in a, in a sort of vector-like way to the right thing—that's quite a sophisticated idea. I, I don't quite know what's the what when the right cognitive moment to bring this in, but I just thought there was there was quite a lot of places you could go with this. And indeed, we didn't get onto all of this stuff, but you can go a long way with this kind of game. You could involve mass and velocity. You could think about the inverse square law rather than going slower when you get closer. You could have an inverse square law. You could have a three, oh, that should be three body problems um, and have planets orbiting around themselves and they can draw where they've been very easily. Um, you could have a spreadsheet that gives a table of position, velocity versus time things and, and graphs to visualize that. There's a, but what I like about all of these things is there things you can just try out. You can just try it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will, by the way, people who are interested in links, I will, I will post all these slides via Ian um, towards the end of the day. So that was, that's, that's example number one, primary school level. Uh, example number two, um, this is more, more of a sort of early secondary stage. This is a, um, how would you estimate the value of pi? We do errors of circles and pi r squared and all that. But it all, when I did it at school, it all felt a bit abstract and remarkable. And you know, there's this funny formula, and you just operate the formula, and lo, um, I become an excellent formula execution device, right? I'm the algorithm that executes pi r squared, but I didn't really understand it at the time. Here's one way which you might understand it. Imagine drawing a, a unit square here. Well, this is a, um, a sort of two unit square around the origin and a circle that uh, is inscribed within it and throw darts at it. Well, and and what proportion of the darts fit inside the circle? Well, of course, the area of the green circle is, if you just look at it intuitively, it's going to be, you know, a bit less than four times r squared. But four to four r squared is the area of the whole square. So it's a bit less than four. So you can see that pi is going to be kind of round about three. Um, and then the proportion of the darts inside, well, it's going to be pi, you have to know the formula for the area of the circle. Okay, pi r squared divided by four r squared. So that's pi over four. So what, how could I then calculate the, um, the area of the, the um, or, or maybe sample the area of the circle. So I did, um, let's see, I made this uh, uh, little spreadsheet. It took me about five minutes. Um, here it is. And, uh, and low, oh, so what did I do here? Were these, um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the first column is the um, X coordinate of my um, uh, dart. The second column is the y coordinate. They're go both going to be random numbers between minus one and plus one. And the inside circle column here is a formula that says, is did the dart land inside the circle? And then at the top here, well, I'm going to, is, is the um, computed value of pi. So I'll just show you the formulae. Uh, here the formulae. So rand in Excel computes a random number between zero and one. So to get it between minus one and plus one, I had to double it and then subtract one. So there's an interesting little piece there. Um, so then I do lots of those. And then this is my calculation. This needs Pythagoras, of course, to um, figure out whether the uh, whether my uh, dart landed inside the circle. And in fact, I decided I didn't need to use square root because if I take the square root of both sides, square root of one is one. Um, and uh, then I just copied down. And what's this formula up here? That, that formula is just tells us some oh, I'm going to count the number of times I get true, right? Because it's true if it lands inside the circle and false outside. I'm going to count the number of trues in this, you know, in this 100 cells. So I've got, I've got you know, C1 to 100. I've just, just copied down, done a lot of them, and divide by the number of rows in C4 to C100. Um, and then I multiply by 4 because that was the, the pi over 4 bit. Um, and low. Uh, so now we go back to here. 
And um, every time I hit refresh, so I'm, I'm secretly typing um, uh, F9 to recalculate every time. Every time I recalculate, I get a different value. Oh, that one's not very close, 2.96, um, 3.17, 2.96. Uh, 3.25. Okay. And then I might think, well, maybe I could get a better estimate if I used more rows. So I think I copy pasted 800 rows. Uh, I have to look down to check, but I think I've got that right. Um, and now when I recalculate, I get value that quite a bit closer to the right answer, you know, more of the time. Um, and I've on the, uh, in this little visualization here, I'm plotting or um, uh, you know, at least the sample of the points that I've done. And that also is a kind of um, very quick thing to do. Um, it's, this whole thing took, takes about five minutes to put together. So um, what am I trying to, uh, to share here? Just that, um, uh, let me go back to uh, this game. Um, just that there's, there's a, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate a sense of symbiosis between computing ideas and maths ideas. So you could think with a, with a maths hat on, you might think I'm trying to um, learn about uh, pi or perhaps about, um, about uh, statistics, actually, um, and about how many, how many values I might need to get how, cl how close to pi. Um, and, uh, but also from a computing idea, I might, might like to think about, I've, I'm learning some incidental skills about how to use spreadsheets. I was flipping between formulae and, um, uh, and values there. I don't know if you saw that, but that's something that's quite useful to know. Um, here in, in this spreadsheet, I've also got the uh, column C has Boolean values. So we're used to seeing, well, in Scratch, you're used to seeing things like if X is bigger than Y, then do this, otherwise do that. But here I'm computing the, the um, you know, inside or outside as a Boolean value, true or false, right? It's a first class values. And indeed, to computer scientists, Boolean values are first class values. Um, but I think it's some, it, it takes a while, even for you know, university students to truly get a hold of that. But there it is manifested as a self, as a value of a self. Um, so it's a lot, there's a lot of, it, you know, stuff going on in this one little um, exercise. I think it's um, um, could go. Uh, I think you could go fairly far with this. Um, so that was a um, uh, a second example. Oh, I'm going to. I need to redisplay the chat so I can see if anybody what what Emily's saying. If anybody, um, let's see. Uh, Uh, Jeffrey asked, you're using geometric ideas. How do you see geometry being part of computing? Um, hmm, I think I've... From, I think I'm probably the wrong person to answer that question. I suppose I see um, being able to visualize things seems super important. Right. That's a. Uh, you, I'm often asking people when they're, you know, in, in a research contest to draw a diagram or to give an example. So, and if you, uh, but I'm not sure that visualization is coterminous with geometry. Um, if you mean specifically geometry, I think you need to ask somebody other than me. Um, uh, Alison says this activity feels if it belongs equally well in a maths or computing classroom. Yes, exactly. That's the whole the whole point. I am the my, the uh, hypothesis I'm exploring is that maybe we won't have maths classrooms and computing classrooms. Perhaps we should only have classrooms, right? And and at primary school, of course, that is the case already. But maybe we think of oh, today we're doing maths or today we're doing computing. I would like to say today we're just doing maths and computing. And maybe at key stage three, you know, all the way up to age fourteen, when we start to separate into GCSEs, perhaps we could. Wouldn't it be great if we just had maths and computing classes? We did not have maths classes and separately computing classes. Um, uh, even if it takes longer, there are lots of learning going on when making it. Yes, that uh, so. And here the question is, will it really take longer? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think there's a lot of research to be done here. My hope is that in the end, it won't. Um, okay, lots of good conversations going on here. Uh, I'm gonna carry on. I want to give a third example. So this third example is a very different, I, I'm, I'm gonna spend longer on this example because it's a less familiar one. And, and my first example was kind of primary school level. Second was probably secondary, um, uh, well, certainly secondary, but um, Perhaps, uh, you know, uh, uh, key stage, late key stage three, early key stage four. Um, this third one is 
perhaps more A level, though I think a good key stage four class could totally go with it. Um, so it's about machine learning. Now, Alec gave a, 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 an, an example in his talk about using um, uh, Wolfram Alpha and, and its ability to build image classifiers. So here he had a magic box, and for him it was a magic box that will take images and spit out, um, you know, classify them into who. So here, here I've got a really simple classifier that is only determining whether the input picture is a picture of Hermione, right? And it will say yes for the first, and it will say absolutely not for the second, because Alec looks nothing like Hermione. Um, but the question is, how does the magic bo box work? And that's what I want to get at um, uh, for a little bit. Uh, so I'm now going to dive into a particular example that you may be much less familiar with and hope, hope that you'll enjoy it. So here's a more, uh, a smaller example. Um, Suppose I want to make a magic box that predicts the quality of a biscuit recipe. And my biscuits are going to be made very simply. They consist of X kilograms of flour, Y kilograms of butter, and the rest is sugar. I mix them together and I bake them, I get biscuits, right? And then I'm gonna feed them to my children and see what they say, is good or bad, right? So in the end, I'm going to produce a sort of chart like this that says I'm gonna have a table with, um, uh, on the right here is the, 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 the data of my table, amount of flour, amount of butter, and um, you know the balance is sugar and the verdict is, good or bad. And then I'm going to plot the good or bad. I can imagine plotting it on a two-dimensional plot. And if I'm lucky, they'll all cluster together like this. And I want to learn from the data which are the good biscuits and which are the bad biscuits. So if I have a new XY pair, I can predict what the answer is going to be. That's a simple version of um, this, right? It's just, it's a, let's scale up a bit. And one way to do it, the simplest way to do this kind of thing is just to suppose we could learn a line that separates these two clusters. Well, um, what does it mean to, to learn a line? Well, uh, well, we know that lines, um, we're mathematicians, right? We say, what's the equation of line? Y equals AX plus B. We could just learn A and B. Could we learn the values of A and B that um, describes a line that separates these um, clusters? Well, that turns out not to work very well, because it doesn't work very well where the lines are steep, right? Or even vertical, because then, you know, A gets too large. So it's kind of better if you can... Um, define your line by this equation, ax plus by plus c equals zero, right? That's, a, that's an equation that also defines a line. It has three parameters, but the, none of the parameters go to infinity. Um, and in fact, it's very nice because if a is zero, you get horizontal lines. If b is zero, you get vertical lines and c sort of um, moves the line, displaces the line around. So this, this turns out to be, this is already an interesting observation that we can describe lines in more than, ones, more than one way. Um, okay. Uh, I'm guessing x plus y is less on. Yes, yes, Miles. The uh, I should have said x plus y. The balance is sugar. It's only one kilogram, so x plus y better be less than one. Um, so I'm going to try to learn a, b, and c. Um, and the good biscuit's going to have the property that ax plus by plus c is going to be bigger than zero, and the bad ones they'll be less than zero. And indeed, um, here's an. Uh, oh, uh, uh, yes, there's indeed a possibility that you could um, find the distance from a point to the line, right? Because you might hope that the further away the line for it, the more confident you were, and you could do a little bit of mathematics to determine the distance away, but that's kind of optional. But basically, the idea is we're going to um, make some kind of magic box that has parameters A, B, and C, um, that has the uh, X and Y coming in on the side, and that spits out yes or no, uh, uh, or a number, uh, because we're going to spread out a, a scalar value, the number which, if it's positive, good biscuit, if it's negative, bad biscuit. The larger the number, the further it is from the line, the more confident we are in our prediction. Okay, so the question is, how can we adjust A, B, and C based on the data until we get as good answers as possible? That's the question before the house. So what do we mean by as good answers as possible? Well, we want to minimize the number of mispredicted biscuits in the training data. Of course, so the training data, might there might be some noisy data or just bad data, so we might not be able to drive it to zero, but we want to minimize mispredictions. So here's what we might um, uh, uh, imagine doing. Let me, I'm going to um, show you this. What we'd like to do is to, um, you could imagine starting with a line, uh, a random line perhaps, and then sort of picking a mispredicted biscuit from the training set, that is from the data of experiments that I did on my children, and um, adjust A, B, and C to somehow tug the line to be mispredicting less, mu uh, less than it was, as it were, tug the line towards the biscuit that's being mispredicted, and then just keep repeating that. And I want to show you um, that uh, in action. This is a... Um, uh, this is something, uh, a little website that you can all go to, and I hope you will. I'll give you the URL in a second. Um, it's called TensorFlow Playground, and it's, um, it, it has a, uh, 
uh, let's see if I um, restart here. Here are the biscuits, just as I showed you, clustered in the way that I showed. And you, um, uh, it's got this little, this little box here is the magic box, uh, the thing in the middle, the one neuron in the middle. And if I press this big play button at the top left here, it then somehow does that procedure that I described and finds a line that separates the biscuit. And if I can, I can stop it and start it again, and I'll get a slightly different line. And you can see um, uh, there's a, um, it computes something called the test loss. The test loss is the essentially the number of mispredicted biscuits. The training loss, which you'll see written just below, that's it keeps some of the train some of the data aside. So it, it, it tests with it trains on some data, and then it has some data kept aside that it doesn't use for training, and it uses for testing to see did the training work out well. That's what's called training loss. And if the loss is zero, it means no mispredictions. That's really good. Okay. So uh, TensorFlow program. Let me give you. I'll give you the URL back in the um, in the slideshow. But you can you can start off right now. You can start off playing with this. Um, what what if you get uh, um, bored in any of this talk? Okay, so I'm going to switch back. Um, where do we go? Uh, yes. So uh, here is the URL: um, playgroundtensorflow.org. Uh, maybe somebody can put that in the chat so that um, anybody who's missed this uh, can, catches it. Okay. Um, now, how are we going to do the tugging business? Well, um, uh, we want to, um, uh, if, if we got a mispredicted biscuit, the output should be positive, but actually it's negative. And I want to adjust A, B, and C to make the output less negative, more positive. How do I do that? Well, one simple idea would be, um, maybe we can um, adjust the uh, parameters most by choosing which parameters most strongly affect the result. Now remember the result R here is simply AX plus BY plus C. That is the thing we're computing. That's what the magic box does. That all it does is compute AX plus BY plus C. Um, you know, it's it's uh, was yes, in fact I, I drew it inside the box. That's it. That's that's what the computation it performs. And so how would we adjust A, B, and C? Um, to drive the output a bit more positive. It was supposed to be positive and it was actually negative. So we want to think about how sensitive is R to changes in A, right? That is, we want the partial derivative of this expression with respect to A. And if we take the partial derivative, I mean, I've written it out in mathematical notation here, but actually it's fairly obvious that the, the sensitivity of R to changes in A is simply X. And the sensitivity of R to changes in B is simply um, uh, uh, where have I, where's my, uh, here I, I want to be able to see the chat. The sensitivity of R to um, changes in B is Y, and the sensitive R to changes in C is 1. Does that make sense? I hope that somebody's going to start asking questions if this, um, but you're all mathematicians, so I'm hoping this is uh, like uh, your mother's milk. Um, so how could I turn this little piece of mathematical reasoning into, well, an algorithm? Uh, well, here it is. Um, I want to adjust, I'm going to successively, each time around, I'm going to adjust A by an amount, if I change A, by an amount that descri is described by its sensitivity um, uh, to, um, uh, to the output, the, the sensitivity of the output with respect to changes in A. So um, since I decided I'm adjusting A in proportion to X, B in proportion to Y, and C in proportion to 1, how much do I adjust them? I need to have a, something called the alpha, which is the learning rate. Right, so maybe alpha is a small number that would adjust things slowly. If it was a bigger number, it would adjust things fast. Maybe I want to start off with a big learning rate and decrease it. That's a piece of black magic that goes into machine learning. Um, and so this is what you do every time around the loop. Um, th this is the whole machine learning algorithm. This is what is going on inside, you know, the classifier that Alec presented with us with. Uh, presented us with this morning. We pick random initial values for A, B, and C. We pick a mispredicted biscuit from the training set. Then we adjust A, B, and C using these equations, right, um, with a particular fixed value of alpha, and then we just iterate. And that's it. That is all of machine learning on one slide. The core algorithm of machine learning. This this um, thing, this uh, step three is called back propagation. Um, now, of course, the reality is always always a bit more complicated, but this is the essence of it, and it's incredibly simple. Um, so, uh, if that was it, then 
I mean, you might think well, it has to be more complicated than that, right? Oh, what about um, um, uh, if the data isn't separable by a line? Um, uh, like here's some data that is, there's no line that separates these. Well, you think maybe I could still learn to separate the good biscuits from the bad biscuits by using more lines. So here's how I could use more lines. I could maybe take two magic boxes to compute uh, here, P and Q respectively, each with independent parameters, A1, B1, and C1, A2, B2, and C2, and somehow combine those P and Q together um, to make the final output R. Maybe that would somehow, I mean, so I've computed two lines here, that's the, the P line and the Q line. And then I said, I said somehow vote, didn't I, right? Somehow vote together. Well, how could I combine two things? Oh, I've got boxes that do that. Um, maybe we should use the same kind of box. Huh, maybe that could just be another box. And now I'm looking at the, um, at the chat in the hope that somebody is gonna say uh, something that is blindingly obvious in retrospect was completely obscure to me in prospect. Why would this could not possibly work? This cannot be an improvement over what we had. We just have to use some mathematical reasoning. Look, here's a big box that has, it has sort of nine input parameters now, but it's still a big box with two inputs and one output. But if we compute what the outputs are, just using you know ordinary algebra, R is A3 times P, B3 times Q, and then do, do this, well, look, crumbs, it's still, something times x and something else times y plus something else. It's that big box was the same as a little box, a single box with three different parameters. So anything I could learn with this three, three thing box, I could learn with a one box. So, you know, total disaster, you know, doesn't, th this, is, this is not a, not a step forward. But I love the way that seeing that it's not a step forward just involves elementary, you know, key stage three level mathematical reasoning. Okay, so what can we do? Well, um, in fact, the, the trick that you have to do, and this is the second key trick of machine learning. If you remember only two things from this talk, the first thing to remember is, this is how backpropagation works. And the second thing to remember is, this is why we need nonlinearity. You stick on the output of these boxes, you can stick a nonlinear function. A very popular one is called ReLU, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit. It's an incredibly simple function. It's zero if its input is less than zero, and it's linear otherwise. Hence, the linear, the linear part is for the greater than zero, the rectified bit is the less than zero. That's all ReLU is. And then you feed that into this other box. And that turns out to be enough. Let me show you. Um, let's go back to TensorFlow Playground. Now, uh, so let me show you some more things you can do then with TensorFlow Playground. You can, you can add layers here. Let me stop this. And let me pick um, the more difficult example here. And of course, if I attempt to do it with this one layer, it tries to learn a line, but it's really not doing very well. You can see the test loss. The test loss is bad, right? 0.4 of all the input test things are not being well predicted. The training loss is for some reason slight. Oh, sorry, the training loss is bad, 0.4. Test loss, unsurprisingly, is a little bit worse. Um, so what to do? Well, what I said was we add um, an extra layer. So let's add a layer. Here, let's add a layer. Um, and let's have a couple of layers here and maybe one here. So this is with only two, two boxes, right? Let's have a try with that. Ooh, well, it's kind of spooky, isn't it? It gives somewhat better, somewhat better. And at this stage, you start to play. You think, hey, let me just add more. You know, how about adding more boxes here? Does that help? Um, and let's make, oh, spookily, it does. Look at that. And these little straight lines around the edge, around the edges of this region in the middle, those are each computed by one of these little guys. Look, they're each computing a different sort of line across. This one looks if it's not doing much good. These ones are all computing lines and they're somehow voted together here. Isn't that cool? You think, ah, oh, um, maybe what would happen if I, um, if I made this a bit harder? What would happen if it was like um, this? Ooh, would that be good enough for this sort of, um, uh, having a bit more trouble here, aren't we? Um, somehow, uh, 
the, the, the way the data is set up is not so good. Maybe, and this stage you can go wild. You think maybe I should have some more layers and maybe they should have some more neurons in them. And then you could just sort of press go. Um, and I have to tell you folks, this is what machine learning people do. They do a lot of suck it and see. Um, and miraculously, it does pretty well. <laughs> um, training loss, very, very good. Um, and this is, you, you now know everything you really need to know about machine learning and you can, you've done it in 15 minutes flat. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, just let me say that um, up here, learning rate, do you remember that alpha parameter? You can change the learning rate here. That was that alpha guy. Um, the ReLU is one of the things you can pick here. There are some others that you can pick tan H and sigmoid, um, but linear I think is no, uh, is the one we started with where there's no um, non-linearity. And sure enough, it doesn't learn a bean. Right, as we discovered earlier. Okay, um, back to uh, back to things, but I'm going to wrap. Um, oops, yes. Okay. Um, right. So I just want to um, finish up. I want to also be able to see the chat, which I can't see at the moment. Yes, I can. Um, good. Uh, oh, Miles says, is there any way to automate the socket and see bit? No, Miles, there isn't actually. All of my colleagues at Microsoft Research are doing a tremendous amount of sucking and vast amounts of um, uh, compute power getting taken, just doing essentially experimental exploration of the design space of their various um, neural networks. It's quite, I mean, there is a lot of um, systematic thinking, of course, a lot of systematic thinking, but there is no, um, there's no completely systematic way of saying, I know that the way to do it is this. There's tremendous amount. It's like the early days of experimental biology in which people were just discovering things in the natural world and classifying them, arranging them into trees and figuring out a bit about how things work, but hadn't yet figured out DNA. Um, now I want to I want to wrap up because I do want to leave time for um, discussion and questions and breakout groups. Um, so the opportunity as I see it then is to um, try to see computing as a school subject, not as a competitive upstart to mathematics, but rather as a, a kind of distinctive lens, a way to think about maths education that lets us see it in a new light. Um, now, um, Alex, um, examples used computing in the service of maths. You might think this machine learning example is using maths in the service of computing. And some of the earlier examples were perhaps more symbiotic. Um, you know, there was, it was more even-handed. I, I don't think it needs to always be, uh, but I would love to have, you know, a single, a single conceptual, you know, subject almost that in which you had examples in which the boot was on each foot alternately and you, you were always marching in, in parallel, that you were each was shedding new light on the other. Um, uh, and I don't think that needs upset maths education. I think more, and this is also in the um, uh, the theme of Alex's presentation about computer-based maths, more helping maths education find its true identity, find the essence of what a good maths education is really like. Um, and so, and this is my final slide then, um, to make one and one make three then would not, will not be easy, I think, because it will inevitably reshape the curriculum of both subjects, actually. I think in George's talk and in Alex, we saw ways in which we can't just take an existing maths curriculum and say, we'll plow through it in the same order and the same things, but we'll just you know, put some computer decoration on the top. We may need to change the sequencing. And I'm not an educationalist. I don't know, you know what would be appropriate and what wouldn't, but perhaps you know, the, when I was talking about negative numbers with my, my nine-year-old, I want, I want, you know, maybe negative numbers or coordinate geometry might occur earlier um, than they would otherwise do. Uh, because the computing applications that we're using to illustrate beg for them. Um, so it may reshape the, the order and the structure of our curriculum development. Um, I do think it needs classroom research, something I know that ATM is keen on um, and, uh, and does a lot of, because it's no, no point in us doing this in airy-fairy ways in universities, still less in industrial research labs. It has to start in the classroom. If it doesn't make sense there, it doesn't make sense, right? We're trying to actually uh, produces education that leads children feeling feeling excited and enthused about what they're doing. Um, and most particularly, it needs educators who are interested in both subjects. And this is, to me, this is the biggest challenge, right? That, um, uh, that uh, 
it, it's not hard to find educators who've thought deeply about maths or to find, or it's a bit harder to find educators who thought deeply about computing and computer science. It's really hard to find people who've thought deeply about both. And yet we want actually every teacher ultimately to have that sort of joined interest. And that is a place where I hope, I think and hope perhaps that ATM as a group might play an, an important and helpful role because you're already geared up on, um, uh, uh, on all of this stuff. Um, and I just want to finish with um, to remind us that it's not some, this is all not so much about education, it's about our children, right? <laughs> that we want them to be engaged and curious and creative and playful about um, you know, our subjects. And we want them to see them as exciting and enriching, not as a dull treadmill. So let, let's stay connected with that. Um, but I'll go back to this uh, and in, invite um, more questions and feedback. Um, Ian, have you been gathering any questions? Um, well, there are some which I think we should perhaps take in the panel. John had a question about generality, which um, is probably more than more than a second to answer. Um, but if we refer questions now to the panel, and I can briefly introduce the breakout notes. Yes. Okay. Should we just just see if anybody who's some? Um, uh, let me see. I'm going to stop sharing um, so I can get my um, video. Has anybody um, got anything they'd like to add? Um, or comment or in, indeed ask just just um, quickly now before we switch to a break, breakout sessions. You know, you could just unmute yourself and dive in. Okay, well, maybe we should do breakout sessions, but I say I'm shocked by there. Ian assured me that it would be difficult to keep the ATM audience down. <laughs> Well, okay, Ian, over to you. Um, just to introduce the, the breakout notebook that you've hopefully downloaded now, what we did was we took a high level view, 50,000 foot view of what mathematics and computer science have in common, as John points out, um, the, the search for generality continues in the higher and higher levels of abstraction. And then we brought it down to key stage one to three with algebra and coding, Key stage two to four with data science and modeling, key stage three to four with reasoning about diagrams, and key stage five to college with reasoning about matrix algebra and its applications. For people who prefer to um, engage with the material through a puzzle, this is a tiling puzzle that we've used with. Uh, um, key stage one children, and um, it is a set of puzzles, but it, it takes you on a journey through uh, problems that have algorithmic solutions to problems which have mathematical solutions, but not algorithmic solutions, to make the distinction between mathematics and computing clearer. The notebook also has activities which we've selected from the sessions in the CTM strand. And there's a question in it which Simon would like you to consider. Simon. Uh, yes. Um, so um, this is this is really the question that I was um, uh, sort of was running right the way through my talk. I would love your help in um, fleshing out examples of. I gave you three examples, uh, a different uh, sort of different age ranges for how. I could imagine computing and maths existing in a sort of richer symbiosis, but I would love to have more examples. Um, because I think it's it's all very well being aspiration. We need to be concrete. Um, so if you could um, talk, you know, uh, in, individually or talk among yourselves to develop um, examples or contexts or um, in in which you could explore a true symbiosis between maths and computing, that would be really helpful. I think if we have a big gallery of such exa such examples. We'll make the whole story much easier to tell. Um, and I think. Um, Ian and I wanted to, because we're in, um, in breakout groups and we don't have a, an easy way to get back together, 
Um, we wondered if you'd be willing, this isn't something that, as I understand, you normally do in the in-person ATM conferences, but if each breakout, breakout group was willing to um, send, uh, you know, one member of each uh, breakout group was willing to send an email to um, Ian to summarize a bit about what, what went on in that group, that would give us some way to connect ourselves back up and also perhaps to provide some raw material for the panel discussion that's taking place at four o'clock. So this isn't a formal requirement, it's a very informal one, but we'd love you to, to take advantage of it if you, if you were willing. Um, so see if you can find a willing rapporteur. Thank you. Okay. You've got eight breakout groups with a dozen people or so in each one. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at 1600 in I-5 or getting emails if you can't attend. Thank you again, Simon, and thanks um, for um, joining us.